Hello Environmental Policy 2 students. Uh, welcome back after the summer session in Environmental Policy 1. I hope everybody uh, caught a little bit of breath in the short break you had between the two courses. But now we're launching into Environmental Policy 2 and so we have to uh, keep pressing forward getting our, uh, our work schedules in order and so we can do well in, in this course. Um, you will notice that uh, the, the grading scheme for Environmental Policy 2 is quite a bit different from in policy, Environmental Policy 1. I've changed the class formats for both 1 and 2 of Environmental Policy uh, to better reflect uh, the types of um, pressures that uh, the students are under and to allow me to better assess uh, your respective performance. Um, this video here uh, really uh, relates to uh, week one and week two of the course. Um, and the, uh, the, the topic of those two weeks, of course, is um, risk assessment in government, which is obviously a critically important uh, issue to deal with when you're dealing with environmental policy of any kind, is how, how do we determine what should be a priority for our limited resources to address environmental problems. Uh, <clears throat> Um, now, it's important for people to understand when you're doing environmental policy that a good chunk of what you're, what you're doing is essentially prioritizing risks because no, no government can undertake all environmental initiatives that it would like to otherwise undertake at the same time. And so we obviously um, have a, uh, a prioritization issue uh, related to risk. And we have a financial issue related to risk because um, there's only so much money to go around to address environmental problems, obviously. So um, financial issues definitely come into play. Economic impact issues definitely come into play in risk assessment. Uh, stakeholder needs and, and, and wishes, uh, 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 government economic priorities, so on and so forth, all come into play in risk management. And they all have to be uh, integrated into risk management in a way that uh, maintains the credibility of the risk management process, or the risk assessment process, sorry, to go on to risk management. Uh, otherwise, uh, if the risk assessment process itself is not legitimate, you're gonna have all kinds of problems at the risk management stage. Um, and so uh, we, want, we want to talk about those, those types of issues uh, for the first and second weeks. Now let's deal with some key terminology uh, related to risk assessment. And the one term that I want you to keep in mind is the term of hazard. What is a hazard? Now a hazard is a, a chemical, physical, or biological substance that has the potential to produce harm to the ecology or to human health, or to wildlife health for that matter. Um, and, uh, and so anything can be hazardous, but uh, the degree to which that hazard results in a risk depends upon other factors that come into play. For example, a risk is defined as the likelihood of an adverse health effect arising from exposure to a hazard in a human population or in the ecology, or in the environment, okay? So you might have a hazard, but if that hazard can be quite readily contained, then maybe the risk of that hazard is, is much less than it would otherwise be if uh, that, that hazard became a, uh, people became exposed to that hazard or the environment became exposed to that hazard. So it's important to understand the difference between hazard, which relates to the physical property of a potential harmful compound or substance or, or biological entity or, or whatever, and the risk that that hazard has to human beings and the ecology and the broader environment are quite, you know, are, are interrelated, but in many ways they're also different things because, like I said, some hazards can be easily contained and some others can't, and therefore the risk of that hazard would go up uh, quite considerably. So risk assessment can be defined as a process that evaluates the likelihood that adverse ecological or human health effects may occur or may occur or are occurring as a result of exposure to one or more stressors, okay? that stressor being the, the hazardous compound, okay? So it's important to make that distinction between the hazard and the risk. And uh, there's gonna be some other concepts that, that, that will come into play uh, that I'm gonna to talk to you about in a minute that further explains uh, the risk dynamic, okay? Now, what are some of the char common characteristics of, of uh, risk assessment? Well, 
one of the common characteristics of that is that because you need to make the risk assessment process as credible as possible to the public and to those who are going to be impacted by regulation or any other type of policy measure, you have to show that the risk assessment process has been based on scientific fact. So science to, to identify environmental and human public health or human health risks is a key aspect of all risk assessment processes. And as I was just saying to you, that because no government has the resources, the unlimited resources to tackle, uh, tackle all risks at the same time, uh, there is always some kind of a priority setting framework that occurs in all risk assessment processes. And those are intended to, re to reflect the severity of risk. But in reality, they also tend to reflect a balance between uh, risk and, and other criteria that enter into any uh, political or policy decision making, such as the you know, fact that there's only so many resources to go around, that there may be economic impacts that can't be well man managed at, the po at this point in time. Therefore, maybe the risk is something you need to absorb for a few more years until the economic circumstances change or that technology can evolve or these kinds of things. So lots of different factors come into risk assessment issues and risk assessment thresholds. Then as you go from science and priority setting frameworks, which are characteristic of, of risk assessment, you move into risk management, which and it's, that's another distinction in concepts that I want you to realize. There's a risk ma assessment phase and there's a risk management phase, okay? And they're not necessarily the same thing. So. Uh, policies and laws are introduced to address, uh, address a risk, you're no longer involved in de defining or characterizing the risk, you're, you're characterizing how that risk is going to be managed. And so you're moving into risk management, which is a different stage from risk assessment, although it's a continuum, obviously. So you introduce policies and regulation, guidelines, uh, options for pollution prevention and control, environmental and human health indicators to monitor and you learn that in your first semester, monitor whether you're doing a good job uh, controlling that risk or not, and so on. So you're, you're entering into the, the risk management uh, 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 realm when you do that, okay? But now let's step back, and, and you, so you now you understand what hazard is, you understand what a risk is, you understand uh, the risk assessment as opposed to risk management. Now what are the key concepts that come into uh, to risk assessment processes? Well, let's deal with these concepts. The first concept I want to talk to you about is what's called a stressor, okay? So that is the cause of the ecological or, or human health harm. These can be chemicals, air pollution, environmental disturbance, climate change, um, uh, you know, uh, particular invasive species like the Asian carp in the Great Lakes, uh, eliminating endogenous species, uh, and so on and so forth. That's the stressor, otherwise known as the pollution problem or the ecological problem or the, uh, you know, anything like that. Could be loss of habitat, any stressor, because all areas of environmental policy, whether it be habitat protection, parks, chemicals, climate, whatever, they all have a, a way of assessing risks. Okay, and those those and there's common characteristics of all environmental and public health uh, or human health risk assessment frameworks. The second is the receptor. You need to have the receptor for it to be a risk. Because remember what I said to you is that there can be a hazard, but if there's no receptor, in other words, the hazard can be well contained, then the risk is minimized. So there needs to be a, a stressor and a receptor. And these are ecosystems, organiz, organisms, people, um, and so on, that, are, that can be negatively affected by the stressor. So they're the people that the stressor does harm to or the ecological or environmental conditions that the stressor does harm to, and that's the receptor. Now, a key factor that enters into a stressor and receptor is there has to be, there has to be an exposure, okay? So for something to, to, to actually turn from, if it's hazardous property, but to turn to a significant risk, there has to be the exposure to the receptor. And that exposure, the reason you flag that criteria separate is, is that the, the, the source of the, the exposure can be quite variable. Even in chemicals, you could get the chemical exposure through food, you could get it through air, you could get it through water, you could get it through the workplace, you could get it through driving in, in urban traffic, you could get any kinds of different exposure um, uh, pathways. And I'll talk to you about the term pathway in a minute. 
So you've got the stressor, the receptor, and the exposure, okay? And that begins to constitute risk. Now the hazard, uh, the hazard property, you know, will will it will be a factor in the in the stressor, obviously. And as I just mentioned to you, a hazard becomes a risk only when that hazard uh, can impact the receptor and there is an exposure uh, basis for that. Okay, that and and we often call that exposure an exposure pathway. Uh, so we often do pathway analysis. For example, if a, a government comes along and says, okay, this compound is, is highly risky or highly hazardous, okay? Let's get, stick with the term. It's highly hazardous compound. Um, to, yeah, okay, to who? Well, the receptor that it's hazardous to would be, let's say, people in this case, okay? Okay, fine, but do we have exposure? Yes, because the compound we're talking about are flame retardants that everybody sprays on uh, couches and, and household furniture and curtains and so on and so forth. And now those have been found to be toxic, persistent, and bioaccumulative. So the exposure is, yes, when I mean, we sit on it, it, it's in these products, and so humans are exposed to them. And that, that level of exposure could pre presents quite a significant hazard. Okay, back to the term hazard. So that's the, you know, the uh, sort of a second use of the term hazard, that in this particular exposure scenario, the hazard is high. Okay, um, and the, so the pathway is that, the pathway is that it, we're using it on our furniture, we're using it th things in the household, it, those get shipped to households, they buy them, blah, 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 put them in their house, they sit on them, and so on. So that pathway is a consumer product. Okay, in this case, the pathway is not air so much that we're worried about or water or land. It's, uh, it's actually a compound that's being used in, in, um, in consumer products. So in that case, um, is, it, is, is the hazard the real problem here or is the pathway? Is it the use? So each one of those things can now be managed. For example, if we were to reduce that risk by eliminating that pathway, in other words, it's not to be used on those furniture anymore, the compound would be still hazardous, but the risk of that hazard to any individuals would be substantially decreased. You understand? So p risk management, as you move to risk management, you have a number of different options. You can, you, can, you, you can sort of regulate the pathway. You can use it for other compounds where the, where the receptor is not so exposed okay but you can't use it in furniture and so on and so forth so you, instead of banning the compound you ban its particular pathway use you understand so there's different it's almost like having a, a a keyboard where you're moving up you know an equalizer where you're moving up different things to be able to manage the risk you know maybe design the product different bring the bring its hazard down or you you know are you change the, expo the exposure pathway of the receptor you bring that down but leave the compound the same way and in each case, at the end, there's an equal sign and there's a degree of risk that you're willing to assume uh, for that particular compound, okay? So remember, stressor, the, the problem, receptor, the ecology or the, or the human being, exposure, uh, what is the level of exposure that turns that hazard into a, a significant enough risk to be a concern? Um, pathway. What is the nature of the pathway that we're most concerned about? Do we just regulate the whole compound? That's all its uses, or are we going to address a particular pathway of exposure of the stressor to the receptor? Okay. So, when you deal with risk, one thing to keep in mind is, without the presence of organisms considered to be important, there is no, you know, without those receptors being there, in principle, there is no ecological risk, or there is no human health risk. Uh, but, uh, you know, say the hazards contained, let's say. Um, so, uh, you know, it's important that those dynamics between those various variables are particularly important to understand because they enter into risk management decisions. Uh, for example, we use all kinds of toxic chemicals in the workplace. We introduce a glo the globally harmonized system, our WIMIS, to control the pathways of that risk to the receptor, right? enhanced information, handle it this way so the pathway of exposure is minimized and you are protected, okay? The compounds continue to be used, but they're used in a certain way, managing the pathway, managing the exposure to the receptor, okay? So 
it, it, those those concepts become particularly important when you're looking at risk assessment, and it's important to understand the relationships between those concepts if you really want to understand how uh, different decisions are taking on on risk management. Okay, why, for example, if we think a compound is really hazardous, uh, don't don't we just ban ban the thing? Well, because it has other valuable uses, uh, and we can control the receptor. Okay, we can ex control the receptor's exposure through the exposure pathway. And if we can control that, then the compound is deemed to, deemed to be hazardous, but, uh, but, but, but le le less hazardous when used under these conditions. Okay, so that's why we don't ban everything that has other, uh, other useful purposes, uh, but, uh, but could, if, if used inappropriately, could, could uh, present a sizable risk. To the environment or human health. Okay. Now, so stressors, receptors, exposures, hazards, pathways, and so on are all uh, particularly important. Now, let's turn to another concept that's really uh, important to understand: is thresholds. How are how are risk thresholds determined to be acceptable or not? Well, like all insurance companies, for example, they determine. Uh, they use actuarial statistics to determine what is an acceptable risk uh, for anything. Uh, you know, even having electrical in your house poses some kind of a risk. But is it a risk that you're willing to absorb because the purpose of electricity far exceeds its negative potential implications? Um, so all, all risk assessment processes have to set up some kind of a threshold process, some way of de determining that that this level of risk is acceptable, but this level of risk is not, okay? And all governments will enter into a considerable dialogue with experts in the field and so on to come up with that understanding what is an acceptable threshold of risk. And uh, those issues will change quite considerably uh, depending upon, you know, the trade-offs you learned about in the first term. You know, what is the trade-off between the environment and the economic? What is the trade-off between um, who's at risk and who isn't. Um, let's face it, there are realities. We accept that certain workers are at higher risk than the average population for all kinds of jobs, right? Um, how many people are at risk? I mean, there can be all kinds of ways where thresholds of acceptable risk will be determined by any government. And that's obviously a, a not necessary. We try to make it as subjective a process, or sorry, objective a process as possible, by the use of science, and that's why science is key. But no science is going to be entirely objective. There's going to be subjective elements that enter into all risk assessment processes. For example, look at the pipeline debates we're having today in Canada. The risk that, say, somebody from Alberta who working in the industry might be willing to assume will be quite a bit different, say, than the risks of the of the, uh, say, Quebec politicians or, or BC uh, coastal activists are willing to assume. So risk is not necessarily something that, well, it's never something that can be eliminate, completely addressed through science. So there's always going to be political and policy implications of how you calculate thresholds. And it's important for, for all students of environmental policy to understand that uh, typically when we're setting thresholds, we're looking for comparables. We're looking for what other countries are doing. We're looking for what the medical science tells us are the long-term implications. So, so um, you know, a lot of risk, risk assessment processes might have been set on acute impacts, like somebody gets immediately sick and dies, or immediately sick and is wiped out for a month in hospital or whatever, attracts a lot more attention, you know, initially at least, than chronic impacts, long-term negative effects of a, of a particular stressor. And so a lot of these factors, you know, acute against chronic, uh, environment against economic, uh, cost of, of mitigation against, uh, against benefits of mitigation, um, all of those factors come into uh, calculating the thresholds, okay, of a risk assessment process. Finally, I want you to take away the, the concept of precaution and the precautionary principle. Uh, the precautionary principle is a particularly important concept in uh, in all sort of environmental policy because it it speaks to um, a a principle that the the lack of perfect science on a on a subject matter on a risk on a stressor and its associated risk uh, okay you know uh, is not in itself 
a reason not to act on that risk, on that hazard that is opposing a risk because there's a pathway to a receptor. Um, so what the cautionary parents principle says is that in the absence of perfect information, but there's enough information to indicate that the risk could be quite high, then preventive action should be taken, even without full scientific certainty, okay? Uh, this, this gives government, you know, um, in theory at least, a basis to act on things that are not fully known. However, uh, we, uh, for the very reasons I talked to you about with respect to thresholds, the trade-offs between environment, economic, risk, cost, benefits, so on, um, precaution is a very difficult uh, issue to see in, or, or concept to see in practice because governments are obviously quite reticent to take on huge, huge costs, huge implications for their economy when the scientific information is not in place. It does happen, but environmental groups are often pushing for, for much stronger adop adopting of the concept of precaution by all governments around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, examples of precaution could be, for example, gen genetically modified foods. Uh, precaution has been very, very key in that because we didn't really know that much about what might be the implications of genetically modified foods, or organisms, okay, of any kind. And so a lot of the activists against GMO have basically relied their arguments on, on the precautionary principle. And we can see that in a number of different cases. Uh, but, but overall, uh, science tends to, has tended to uh, play a fairly uh, solid or much heavier role in the process of risk assessment necessarily than precaution has. Um, and, but we're constantly arguing that if we had practiced more precaution back when we first brought out DDT or when we first brought out uh, uh, PCBs or when we first brought out... Uh, or we first started burning oil and carbon products, uh, we would have been much better off today than we are, okay? Now that's debatable uh, on every one of those compounds, including uh, oil and gas, but um, these are the arguments that environmental groups will often use for the precautionary principle, okay? So those are key concepts that I want you to you know, keep in mind to show uh, so it's, you know, risk assessment is not this esoteric process that's difficult to understand. If you understand the key principles of risk assessment, um, uh, you know, the stressor, the receptor, the exposure, the hazard, and the pathway, um, you, you, you really understand how in risk assessment, even though it's the assessment stage, a lot of how we're defining what we're willing to accept as a society, as a people, comes out to play as we balance these things. Are we just going to control the pathway? And therefore, we can control the hazard. And therefore, it's not the risk is quite low. Or we can't really control the pathway. Um, uh, that, therefore, the, 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 the uh, risk to the receptor is quite high with respect to transferring most of the hazard of the stressor onto the receptor then uh, we probably need to take action. Climate change is an a really good example of that. We have a stressor, which is GHGs, greenhouse gases in the environment. We have a receptor, which is virtually the entire global environment and all of humanity and all of wildlife in it. We have an exposure because it's, it's, it's everywhere in the atmosphere. Okay, so everybody is exposed to one degree or another. Therefore, the hazard of that stressor is, is high and increasing because we're not able to, we haven't been able to control the pathway, the burning of fossil fuels and it going out into the environment, okay? So every environmental issue can be, every assessment of risk can be, uh, you, you know, looked at for, with the use of those concepts, whether it be wildlife habitat, uh, wetlands, uh, chemicals, uh, climate, uh, biodiversity, uh, they all have risk assessment uh, uh, processes embedded in that in that uh, sort of area of work, and they all, to one degree or another, deal with stress or receptor exposure, hazard, and pathway. Okay, so uh, keep those things in in mind. And then the other two key concepts are threshold, because science is never going to answer that ultimate question for you: what we what are you willing to accept? Okay, as a collective entity. And the other is precaution and the precautionary principle. So keep those concepts firmly in mind. Now, on a different note, I want you to keep in mind that there's a lot of readings for each week in this course. 
But like in Environmental Policy 1, the readings are there for your, for your purposes to go through to make sure you understand the concepts. Read them to the extent where you feel that if you had to sit down and write up the various features and principles of processes of risk assessment, you could, you could answer that question to your satisfaction. At this level of a graduate certificate, I'm expecting you to take responsibility for your understanding of the issue, the topics, and the concepts that are covered off for each of the weeks, as indicated in the CSI and in the verbal uh, video lectures that I'll be giving you each week. If it means reading all of the material, fine. If it means reading the first few because that gave you a good enough breadth and just skim the others, fine. It's up to you as a professional to uh, determine where, where, where your level of understanding uh, has been met. Okay. So on that score, I'll let you go. I'll be back next week to talk about um, uh, the, the, um, the third week's um, uh, topic for the course because this lecture dealt with the first two weeks. Okay. Talk to you again soon and good luck. Bye-bye now.